Section 16 of Northern Trails, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel Carr. Northern Trails, Book 1 by William J. Long. Section 16. Hour after hour they struggled on, hand in hand, without a thought of where they were going. Twice Mooka fell and lay still, but was dragged to her feet and hurried onward again. The little hunter's own strength was almost gone, when a low moan rose steadily above the howl and hiss of the gale. It was the spruce woods, bending their tops to the blast and groaning at the strain. With a wild whoop, Noel plunged forward, and the next instant they were safe within the woods. All around them the flakes sifted steadily, silently down into the thick covert, while the storm passed with a great roar over their heads. In the lee of a low branch spruce they stopped again, as though by a common impulse, while Noel lifted his hands. Thanks, thanks, Kisuo, look, we can take care of ourselves now. The brave little heart was singing under the upstretched arms. Then they tumbled into the snow and lay for a moment, utterly relaxed, like two tired animals in that brief, delicious rest which follows a terrible struggle with the storm and cold. First they ate a little of their bread and fish to keep up their spirits. Then, for the storm that was upon them might last for days, they set about preparing a shelter. With a little search, whooping to each other lest they stray away, they found a big dry stub that some gale had snapped off a few feet above the snow. While Mooka scurried about, collecting birch bark and armfuls of dry branches, Noel took off his snowshoes and began with one of them to shovel away the snow in a semicircle around the base of the stub. In a short half hour he had a deep hole there, with the snow banked up around it to the height of his head. Next, with his knife, he cut a lot of light poles and scrub spruces, and sticking the butts in his snowbank, laid the tops like the sticks of a wigwam firmly against the big stub. A few armfuls of spruce boughs shingled over this roof, and a few minutes' work shoveling snow thickly upon them to hold them in place and to make a warm covering. Then, a doorway, or rather a narrow tunnel, just beyond the stub on the straight side of the semicircle, and their camusi was all ready. Let the storm roar and the snow sift down. The thicker it fell, the warmer would be their shelter. They laughed and shouted now as they scurried out and in, bringing boughs for a bed and the firewood which Mooka had gathered. Against the base of the dry stub they built their fire, a wee sociable little fire, such as an Indian always builds, which is far better than a big one, for it draws you near and welcomes you cheerily, instead of driving you away by its smoke and great heat. Soon the big stub itself began to burn, glowing steadily with a heat that filled the snug little camusi, while the smoke found its way out of the hole in the roof, which Noel had left there for that purpose. Later the stub burned through to its hollow centre, and then they had a famous chimney, which soon grew hot and glowing inside, and added its might to the children's comfort. Noel and Mooka were drowsy now, but before the long night closed in upon them, they had gathered more wood, and laid aside some wisps of birch bark to use when they should wake, cold and shivering, and find their little fire gone out, and the big stub losing its cheery glow. Then they lay down to rest, and the night and the storm rolled on unheeded. Towards morning they fell into a heavy sleep, for the big stub began to burn more freely as the wind changed, and they need not stir every half hour to feed their little fire and keep from freezing. It was broad daylight, the storm had ceased, and a woodpecker was hammering loudly on a hollow shell over their heads, when they started up, wondering vaguely where they were. Then while Noel broke out of the camusi, which was fairly buried under the snow, to find out where he was, Mooka rebuilt the fire, and plucked a ptarmigan and set it to toasting with the last of their bread over the coals. Noel came back soon with a cheery whoop to tell the little cook that they had drifted before the storm down the whole length of the great barren and were camped now on the opposite side, just under the highest ridge of the top gallants. There was not a track on the barrens, he said, 
not a sign of wolf or caribou, which had probably wandered deeper into the woods for shelter. So they ate their bread to the last crumb, and their bird to the last bone, and giving up all thought of hunting, started up the big barren, heading for the distant lodge, where they had long since been given up for lost. They had crossed the barren and a mile of thick woods beyond when they ran into the fresh trail of a dozen caribou. Following it swiftly, they came to the edge of a much smaller barren that they had crossed yesterday, and saw at a glance that the trail stretched straight across it. Not a caribou was in sight, but they might nevertheless be feeding or resting in the woods just beyond, and for the little hunters to show themselves now in the open would mean that they would become instantly the target for every keen eye that was watching the back trail. So they started warily to circle the barren, keeping just within the fringe of woods out of sight. They had gone scarcely a hundred steps when Noah whipped out a long arrow and pointed silently across the open. From the woods on the other side, the caribou had broken out of a dozen tunnels under the spruces and came trotting back in their old trails, straight downwind to where the little hunters were hiding. The deer were acting queerly, now plunging away with the high awkward jumps that caribou use when startled, now swinging off on their swift, tireless rack, and before they had settled to their stride, halting suddenly to look back and wag their ears at the trail. For Megaleep is full of curiosity as a wild turkey, and always stops to get a little entertainment out of every new thing that does not threaten him with instant death. Then out of the woods, behind them, trotted five white wolves. Not hunting, certainly, for whenever the caribou stopped to look, the wolves sat down on their tails and yawned. One lay down and rolled over and over in the soft snow. Another chased and capered after his own brush, whirling round and round like a little whirlwind, and the shrill key-yi of a cub-wolf plane came faintly across the barren. End of section 16 Recording by Rachel Carr